We're going to continue in our studies looking at the question, why is this dispensation called the dispensation of grace? And we've looked at uh, part of the, the answer to the question. It's, it's a multifaceted question. Uh, the dispensation of, of grace is, uh, certainly characterizes several different things going on from God today in this dispensation. Um, but in Ephesians chapter 3, in verse 1, we read, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you've heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which is given me to you, or how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words. Now we know that this dispensation of grace was not revealed in the prophetic scriptures, um, so this time we call it the dispensation of grace. Uh, it's on the chart here, labeled as the dispensation of grace. Uh, that in time past, there was no revelation about what God was going to do uh, and that he planned to interrupt the prophetic program before its conclusion. Uh, and in doing so, we've had 2,000 years that we call the dispensation of grace. And the prophetic program was interrupted just before, uh, of course, uh, the conclusion was, is for the prophetic program, the next event that was on the prophetic calendar uh, is this time that we know is wrath, this time of judgment, the day of the Lord, the tribulation period. There will be seven years of tribulation as described in Daniel chapter 9. So the next event that was interrupted is there's a term in the scriptures, uh, call it the wrath to come. So I'd like you to turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 3. And we're going to look at how the scriptures describe the next event that the dispensation of grace interrupted was this time of wrath and judgment that God had talked about through all his holy prophets since the world began. Uh, and so Matthew chapter 3 now, we're looking at verse 7. But when he, John the Baptist, saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, <clears throat> who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? So there's the term, the wrath to come. Now, he's describing that judgment. So, so here John the Baptist is talking to a group of people, and there are those in that group that he's saying, who's warned you to show up here today because you fear that you'll go through that wrath to come? And uh, really, he's, he's, he's actually, in a sense, he's provoking them because he knows they're not there for that purpose. They're actually there to see what was going on, what the people were doing at this baptism. And there are masses of people that had showed up, and they're there just trying to monitor what's going on uh, in, this, in this religious gathering. And so the Pharisees and Sadducees rejected their Messiah. We know he, they crucified him. But they show up here at John's baptism and he, and he asks them the question. Uh, he, uh, he, he charges them or rebukes them. O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to free, flee from the wrath to come? So that's the term that the scriptures use to describe the tribulation period. The wrath to come. And so the dispensation of grace is the uh, putting off, if you will, the delay that, that God gave the world some more time, a grace period, if you would, and, and his long suffering, as, as Peter calls it in 2 Peter chapter 3, uh, he's, Peter refers to, the, to Paul's letters, his writings, and he says, Paul has written to explain why God has been long, this interruption is the long suffering of God for salvation. Uh, delaying that time of judgment and wrath that be poured out from heaven on, upon this earth and all the nations in the earth, not just Israel, but all the nations. If you turn now to Romans chapter 5, there are several references uh, to this coming judgment, uh, the one that will immediately follow the rapture of the church, the body of Christ. We don't have any prophetic dates that we need to fear or look forward to to, to mark the conclusion of this dispensation of grace, because we're not the subject. This dispensation of grace wasn't talked about by prophecy. It was not in view of prophecy. It was something God only revealed through Paul. 
And so Paul talks about the rapture could happen any day. Paul thought it could happen in his lifetime. But the very next prophetic event after the rapture is the wrath to come. Uh, Romans chapter 5, and look at verse 8. But God commendeth his love toward us, and now while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath to come. So there is the terminology. The nice thing about the King James Bible is you can study it. The terminology is the same throughout the scriptures about the same events. And that's an easier way to study your Bible. So uh, Paul uh, gives reference to the fact that the church, the body of Christ, by the rapture, were promised that God will take out the ambassadors uh, today. We're called God's ambassadors by the Apostle Paul and by inspiration of God in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that we're the ambassadors for Christ, and God's going to call his ambassadors out before he starts the, the campaign of, of the hail fire coming down from heaven and judgment upon the earth and all those trumpets and vials and bowls of wrath that the book of Revelation talks about. That period is known as the wrath to come. Paul mentions, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The terror of the Lord is going to be poured out. The world has never seen a judgment. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ on his throne is going to be visible from the heavens during this time that God judges the earth. We look at the Iraq war and we think of how, how heavy uh, weapons were used to from the ships and, and from the air to, to soften the terrain of the battlefield. Well, the, the bombs and the missiles at this time are going to be coming from God from the heavens. And his uh, storehouses in the heavens are going to be opened up uh, for, with the uh, artillery that's going to be used upon, against this earth and against the, the rebellion of the earth against God Almighty. The earth is ripe for the judgment of God to fall according to all the the rejection of God's program in time past, whenever the Lord shows up, and it's imminent, it's going to happen immediately, but God postpones that time of wrath and judgment with this current dispensation of grace. Go to, uh, uh, next turn with me if you would, to um, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, this is the second book that Paul wrote, by the way. Uh, it's the one that there's 1 and 2 Thessalonians, especially the first, uh, first book of, of Thessalonians, is full of references. Every chapter uh, is a reference to the catching away of the church. Some people don't like the term rapture because it's not a Bible word. But the catching away of the church is in every chapter of 1 Thessalonians. And uh, here in uh, the first chapter, in verse 10, uh, Paul mentions that and that we as the church, the body of Christ today, we, we wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, notice, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Now that's part of our blessed hope. We don't have to fear this time of, of terrible and horrible judgment upon the earth from God Almighty. Because God's going to catch the saints, his believers that are in Christ, away before he begins this judgment, prophetic, prophesied judgment. Uh, it's not going to happen during this time period when God has interrupted the prophetic program, but it will immediately follow uh, this dispensation of grace. So uh, look at chapter 5 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 9. For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, and that would be the rapture. That whole time period, that whole seven-year period, uh, is going to be is known as uh, the tribulation period. But it, it's known as the wrath to come. The wrath begins with the first events of that prophetic uh, time of judgment of God, the 70th week of Daniel. Again, Daniel chapter nine explains it. Right after the, uh, the Messiah being cut off from Israel is in the 69th week of years is this, seven, this last week, seven years of the week of the tribulation period. So what virtue, we talk about the, the question is, so why does God call this dispensation the dispensation of grace? Isn't God gracious in all dispensations? And the answer is absolutely he is. 
Is salvation not available to believers except in the dispensation of grace uh, by the grace of God Almighty? Is God not gracious in any other time in the scriptures? And that's not true. Salvation is only by God's mercy and grace. Is God's purpose and plan for salvation through the cross, isn't that available to people in other dispensations? Well, absolutely. So salvation is by God's grace. Christ did and came and did as the only righteous person who's ever uh, walked the face of this earth. He died to pay for the sins of all men. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The law of Moses as God's perfect, holy, righteous standard was to show the world they needed God to make them righteous. They had to look to God for eternal life because God had to make them righteous, but God being a just God had to settle the sin issue at the cross. So the new covenant would be described as God's grace to offer salvation through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews explains that to the saints that are going to live during this prophetic conclusion. Um, but the Apostle Paul writes about how through the cross, God is provide, providing today grace. God, uh, through Christ, is reconciling the world unto himself today. That's a reference to uh, the world as a whole was ripe for the judgment and wrath of Almighty God to be poured out against it. But God, through the cross, not at the cross, but through the cross, made it, the cross made it possible for God to give an extension of time before this judgment would be poured out. And then, the, during this time period, God will judge the world uh, for sin. And so, uh, Revelation chapter 20 and 21 talk about God judging those that are, are unbelievers at the great white throne of judgment, uh, as illustrated here on the chart, according to their deeds, their sins. Romans 2 talks about that as well. So, the, by ver if you consider God pour, holding back his wrath during this dispensation, what virtue of God describes holding back the wrath that's due and the punishment and the judgment that the world was due, the, ex the executioner was ready to, to, to pour out his judgment against the condemned, Jews and Gentiles, the whole world. But giving an extension of time, what virtue of God would describe that extension? Would it be God's law? Would it be God's holiness gave an extension of time before his wrath is poured out? That's a virtue of God, his, his justice, his holiness, but it's God's grace that would allow the gift of this dispensation to give long-suffering, his mercy. Grace is that which you just uh, you don't deserve, it's a gift that you don't deserve that, you're, that you receive. That's grace. The unmerited favor of God. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. That's that, the difference between the two words is, is that grace is getting what you don't deserve and mercy is not getting what you deserve. Uh, so, you would, so calling it the dispensation of grace because God is given an extension and not pouring out his wrath uh, is, is the first reason we've discussed why it's called the dispensation of grace. We've talked about God's attitude toward the world today, not executing judgment for the sins of nations or not uh, executing judgments for the individual sins that we commit, not punishing those. That would be the law program. So it's, we're not, grace is the contrast, it's, we're not under the law, we're under grace. The covenant that was to replace the law covenant, Hebrews tells us, is the new covenant. So God's grace through the blood that ratified the new covenant at the cross, God is giving us the promises and blessing Israel will receive under the new covenant. We're, we receive in this age of grace by being identified with Christ. In Christ, we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, God's perfect righteousness imputed to us. Justification, we're declared righteous in Christ. We receive eternal life and righteousness in Christ in this age of grace. The, the spiritual blessings promised to that nation, not the physical blessings. We don't claim to have uh, Israel's promise of the, of the land and, and all the different promises God gave to Israel of a physical uh, inheritance. 
in the earth, in the kingdom of heaven that God, uh, the Lord was talking about in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That kingdom, that millennial reign of Christ is going to be the conclusion, the fulfillment of all the promises God made to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. They're all going to be received in Christ. Galatians 3 says he's the seed. Uh, the law was given um, because of transgressions until the seed would come. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. And now after that, uh, the, the faith of Christ is making it possible for Israel to receive the Abrahamic promises of eternal life in the land forever. We receive eternal life, not the land promises and the physical promises God made to that nation. Go to uh, Romans chapter 6 now. <clears throat> so, the other part that we've been talking about, now we, we're, we're going to pick up with this again. God's operating program that he dealt with his people in time past was known as the law program. Not only is the law a perfect standard to show all that they're sinners, uh, Romans chapter 3, 19 and 20. But it's also the, uh, the constitution, if you will, that, that governed the nation of Israel. The priesthood, Israel's religious leaders, were also uh, those who uh, meted out the law for the nation of Israel and the punishments and, and so forth were through the Aaronic priesthood. And so the law program was an operating system by which, if you read Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28, 29, and 30, you read about curses and blessings upon Israel, whether or not they were keeping the law. Now, those curses and those blessings, as God explains in those uh, two sections, those two uh, uh, texts of the Bible, they're mainly national. Israel as a whole received deliverance, uh, protection from their enemies if, when they were walking under the law. And the only example in Israel's history of that would be the reign of David and Solomon. You see those, that time in Israel, if you would, when God's grace was reigning and, and Israel was elevated, uh, their wealth, their prosperity, their crops, their, their population, everything was, was uh, God was blessing. They were walking under the law. They were not, uh, especially in the life of David. They, now, in, in Solomon's lifetime, what happened in, later in his lifetime? He brought in all these Gentile gods. He married wives of the other nations. And, and he began to worship other gods. So at the end, by the end of Solomon's lifetime, God divided the nation of Israel, ten northern tribes, two southern tribes. That's when, after that, you don't see very many bright spots in Israel's history. It's all judgment. Again, Leviticus 26 explains all that to you, your Old Testament. So in Romans chapter 6, again, the question is, uh, look at verse 1, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? If God is not judging us today, or, or giving us a blessing today because of our performance and curses if we don't obey them under the law, then is the idea that we can sin to make God's grace look even greater. Look at uh, verse 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What shall we say then, because we're not under the law, uh, but under grace, excuse me, what shall we say then, shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace, God forbid. We are under grace as an operating program. Being under the law, being under the dominion of the law equals being under the dominion of sin. Now, Paul explains why that's true. Is there something wrong with the law? Does, is, is the law the cause of sin? Well, obviously no. All the law is, is God's perfect standard. Uh, the Ten Commandments, expect, especially, we look to as God's standard of righteousness. All those things are still, if you violate the Ten Commandments, it's still a sin. Um, many of them punishable. Uh, uh, but we're under grace, so the idea is not to sin more because God is being gracious to us, but the idea is, being under grace, we have the choice now to walk under the righteousness God has made us in Christ by faith, and we have the ability not to be under the dominion and mastery and, and reign of sin. And so that's what we're looking at here in, in, in Romans. Uh, look at verse 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? 
God forbid. How shall we, notice there's an application of a truth in, in the next verses. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know you not that so many as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, if you notice in this chapter, there's no water mentioned. So the preceding baptism, like John the Baptist and, and, and the Lord and his disciples practice uh, in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, of course, the Lord didn't baptize anybody. His disciples did. Uh, but that water baptism is not the baptism Paul is referencing here. This is not water baptism. Uh, hold your place here and go to Ephesians chapter 1. The book of Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, eternal life, until the redemption of the purchased possession, the rapture, unto the praise of his glory. So you trust the gospel, God, the Holy Spirit, sees your positive response to the gospel and immediately seals you into Christ. Now, the other verse to compare with this, or right in your margin, is 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Verse 13, 1 Corinthians 12, 13. How do you get in? Uh, how is it that the Holy Spirit seals us in Christ? Well, when you trust the gospel, that's when it happens. Uh, verse 13 says, For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. The moment we trust in Christ as our Savior, God the Holy Spirit does the baptizing. Uh, if you go to Colossians, the book, book of Colossians, and, and chapter 2 of Colossians, uh, the book of Colossians tells us that um, in verse 12, we're buried with him in baptism, wherein you're also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. God is the operator, the Holy Spirit is the operator that went by faith in the gospel does the operation of baptizing you into Christ. It's a spiritual baptism. It's an identification with Christ. Go back to Romans chapter 6. We're identified with the Lord in his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Now follow me in, in chapter 6 again of Romans. And we read again verse 3. Know you not so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ, when you trust the gospel, were, were past tense, baptized into his death, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. So we're identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection. The operation is by the Holy Spirit, through faith in the gospel, identifies us spiritually with Christ. By one spirit we're all baptized in one body. Verse 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, physically, bodily resurrection. Uh, but here the application is we should walk in the resurrection life, spiritual life. We're dead to sin, we're alive unto God is the application being made here. So we should walk in Christ is resurrected, seated at the right hand of the Father in the heavenly places right now. Um, and we should walk in the resurrection life that Christ has, because we're in Christ. He's resurrected, we're resurrected. Verse 5, if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we, should, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this. And again, verse 6, knowing. So we study these things so we know something that we can apply by faith in our, in our walk as believers today. Knowing that our old man is crucified with him. When God sees you, in his son, he sees your old sin nature as already dead. He sees it crucified with his son on the cross. So God doesn't see the activity of your old sin nature. You're going to have your old sin nature as a believer until you die and until it's put away and put in the ground. Till then, you have the opportunity to, by faith, walk as somebody who's resurrected with Christ and put off the, the attitudes and the thoughts of the old sin nature. You can put those off and reckon them to be dead. And that's what he's saying here. This is, 
chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans are given for our walk as believers. Uh, we're to apply these truths in our walk by faith. Uh, again, verse 6, knowing that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. Notice that we henceforth, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Does it say that we will not serve sin? Does it say that we cannot serve sin? It says that we should not serve sin. Now, what happens to believers when they get saved and they put themselves under the law? Well, in the next chapter, Paul explains that's what happened to him. He was a Pharisee. He got saved, and he started to try to perform the law so that he could please the Lord in, in a walk of righteousness. And what did he say that he found out? He said that when he did, he was condemned by the law and he died. And you understand this faith walk when you read the next chapter, chapter 7 of Romans. But notice the application here in this chapter. Verse 7, we should not serve sin in the end of verse 6. Verse 7, for he that is dead, are you dead? Are you identified with Christ in his death, burial, and resurrection? He that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we should also live with him. Notice the terminology, we're freed, we're emancipated, we're not under the dominion of sin, the shackles have been broken, we don't have to do everything the sin nature wants us to do anymore. We're free from that. We can practice that freedom in our faith walk that we can, by faith, apply the resurrection life we have in Christ. Verse 8. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also, shall also live with him in the present context. Verse 9, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. Death doesn't have dominion over somebody who is raised in a body that will live forever. And that's the condition Christ is in. And we're in Christ. We have his resurrection life. Death hath no more dominion over us either. In Christ. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Now, here's the application, verse 11. Likewise reckon yourselves, <clears throat> likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. He's not talking about one day when you die, you won't sin anymore. You'll, you'll put away this body of flesh with the old sin nature, and in your resurrection body, you won't have a sin nature, so you won't sin anymore after you die and go to heaven. He's saying, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. Your mortal body is your body that's subject to death. This body, this body of sin that we live in. That we should obey it in the lust thereof. So the lusts are going to come. He's saying the lusts are there in this body that we now have, our mortal body, but you don't have to obey them. Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So that's a choice for a believer today. We've been by one spirit, we've been identified together with Christ. We're in Christ. We're identified in Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. God has made us to be righteous in Christ. God did that by identifying us together with his Son, with his Holy Spirit baptism that, that happens the moment we trust the gospel. Verse 15, uh, again, uh, verse 14, For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So as an operating program, God deals with us through his grace today. We're to walk by faith in the new identity God has given us in Christ. And that is why it's called the dispensation of grace, because we're not under the law. And Paul makes it clear, and we're going to look next time at some of the verses Paul talks about. God reveals through Paul, the book of Galatians, how we're to walk under grace and not under the law.